السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Trinidad I had three doubles this morning So now I'm at a total of seven doubles from yesterday till today So the brothers now have been telling me You know, Sheikh, you got, you got to really slow down now Even for a Trini, that's too much You're making ghulu of this double thing so I said, fine, I'm going to have to try to slow down, inshallah, for today. To just really get into what I want to discuss with you, inshallah, in the next few moments that we have with each other. My topic for you is titled the Qur'an, depression and anxiety. Really and truly what Qur'an has to say about these problems. I'm actually not going to speak to you about depression itself or anxiety itself. You need somebody professional, somebody who's qualified to discuss those topics, and I'm not one of them. What I can do, inshallah ta'ala, is kind of give you a glimpse of how Qur'an teaches you and I to get control over your feelings. You know, we live in a time right now where hundreds and thousands of Muslim families deal with the crisis of a mother or a wife, she wakes up and she feels absolutely miserable. And she'll come and say to you, I don't feel like praying Fajr today. The husband, he'll say to you, I don't feel like going to the masjid, but I know I have to. I know I should. So people have lost a lot of joy and happiness in their life, not just with Islam, but just in life in general and how you talk and you deal with one another. I'm sure a lot of you probably sitting here, actually have those feelings. There was probably days in your life and those days still probably continue today where you wake up and you look at your, your spouse, your husband and your wife and you don't even want to talk to them. You don't want to say a word to them. And they're standing there, miskin, you know, husband is like, what's wrong with you today? And she says to you, you're ugly. <laughs> you know, and you're like, what are you talking about? You married me. Yeah, but today you're ugly. For no reason. And you're thinking to yourself, and that attitude, that feeling, you know what happens? It starts carrying over into your religion, into your ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before you know it, you know what you feel like when you're praying salah, and you're standing behind the imam, and he's crying his tears out in salah, but you're just miserable and you can't wait for salah to finish. What's really happening in you? And how are you gonna get control over those feelings, those thoughts, the worst of which lead to depression and anxiety. So what's, what does Qur'an have to say about all of this? What does Allah Azza wa Jal say to you and I to solve this? I want to start off, insha'Allah ta'ala, by saying to all of you that I am only going to discuss two verses in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Hijr. It's actually the last two verses of Surah Al-Hijr. But I want to recite to you at least three or four of these verses. And I say to you, recite, because part of your journey to getting control over your feelings, to be able to make proper decisions in your life, to feel joy and happiness about everything and everything that comes in your way, is going to be the recitation of Qur'an. If I can use the term correctly, this is going to be the real music to your ears. It's going to be the real rhythm and the thing that starts to bring comfort to you. And that's all I want to achieve, insha'Allah ta'ala. So here you are. 
you feel miserable about something or many things in your life, the Prophet ﷺ felt the same way with all the mushrikun around him. Imagine this one brother, this one man, is amongst hundreds of disbelievers and everybody's pointing at him and saying to him, you're crazy, you don't know what you're talking about, you're foolish, you're this and you're that. And they threaten his life and try to assassinate him all because of his message. So he starts to kind of go into his own state of depression and anxiety. He starts feeling horrible and miserable. He's a human being, so he has these feelings. Listen to what Allah Azza wa Jal said to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 94 in Surah Al-Hijr, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ فاصدع بما تؤمر وأعرض عن المشركين إنا كفيناك المستهزئين الذين يجعلون مع الله إلها آخر فسوف يعلمون وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ وَاعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى so here he is. He's feeling as though the whole world is collapsing on his shoulders. You feel the same way in your circumstance, in your life, with your family, with your friends, with your community. Something in your life is making you feel the exact same way. Allah Azza wa Jal said to him, and we're just going to go right into the second last verse. Allah said to his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمْ O Muhammad, we have knowledge and we know exactly how you feel. Pause. You see what just happened? A number of things just happened here. A whole series of things just happened. The first of which, Allah recognized there was a problem for him. He didn't say, what's wrong with you? He didn't say, you're a prophet. He didn't say, look, you're a Muslim. He didn't say, Akhi, you know, you should never feel depressed. What's wrong with you? You know, you're a Muslim. You have Allah and you have Quran. How could you feel that way? You shouldn't be feeling so depressed and so sad and this and that. Allah said, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمْ We have knowledge. We know and it's there. We recognize it. So the first thing is to try to get control over yourself and to start feeling good about your life and the decisions you make is you have to recognize when you fall into a problem, when you start getting these feelings, you recognize the reality of them and you say, yes, you know what? Yeah, I do feel upset. Yeah, when I prayed Fajr this morning, I felt miserable praying. I couldn't wait for it to finish. Yeah, I do have that. The second lesson you get from this one phrase is Allah used the plural form when He talked about Himself. He didn't say, وَلَقَدْ أَعْلَمْ He said, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمْ We have knowledge. We understand. Who's Allah talking about? Scholars, they say two things is happening here. Number one is Allah Azza wa Jal is, is referring to Himself in a mighty and majestic manner. This is the honorable, this is the great, this is the mighty and the majestic Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's befitting for him to refer to himself in the plural form. The Queen of Elizabeth, when she gives a speech, she also says the same thing. She says, we the people, but she's talking about herself and the people. 
So Allah Azza wa Jal is doing the exact same thing. It's raising his status, raising his honor in front of all of us. The second thing that's happening is Allah Azza wa Jal is telling you when you have this feeling, when you're going through this problem, me, O oh Allah, and my angels, we know what you're dealing with. Allah is the commander and the chief, and the angels execute his command. He creates it, he commands it, and the angels do the, do the groundwork for him. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, all of us we know. Me that I'm above all of you, but also the angels amongst of you, we have knowledge of what you're dealing with. When that kid who memorizes Qur'an, you see in the West we have this phenomenon that's Alhamdulillah, it's not as widespread as, we, as, as people think it is, but it, it actually exists where you would have a child who would go and memorize Qur'an and go to the Sunday school and he'll grow up and he'll lead the salah in the masajid and he'll do the taraweeh, then he goes off to college. Guess what happens to him? One of those Christian groups or those Bible groups take a hold of him and they start teaching them and start telling them about their theories and philosophies about life. And you know what happens to that kid who memorized Quran, who got the Islamic trading in your home? They come up one day and they say, you know what, dad? I don't know if Islam is really right for me. <laughs> you know what, mom? This hijab thing, it's just a choice. I, don't, I can't see it in the Qur'an. People say it's there, but I can't really see it. I don't want to wear it anymore. And you're thinking to yourself, what just happened here? So Allah Azza wa Jal says, we know this problem that you're dealing with. Continue. <laughs> Allah describes the problem. أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدُرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know this problem is there. And we know that inside of you, you feel as though somebody is taking the life out of you. In the West, we say, I don't know if you guys say the same thing here, when you have butterflies in your stomach, you know, you feel like you can't swallow your food because you just want to cry, you just want to scream, you're so bottled up with emotion and problem, you don't know who to talk to anymore, you feel like your life is all just one big prison, so you can't swallow, you can't breathe that well. And this is just your feelings talking to you at this point. Allah is saying, يَضِيقُ sadruk. يَضِيقُ sadruk. You know what kind of picture this is? Think of somebody that takes a wet rag or a wet cloth and they squeeze that wet cloth. So somebody is literally squeezing the inside of your stomach and that's how you feel. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, we have knowledge of exactly what's going on inside of you. Maybe you can't talk to no one, but we know, we understand. I want to just share with you one very important point of what's happening here. Do you notice that you, the person who has these problems, do you notice that you're not alone? This is the worst thing to do when you have these problems. People when they get depressed, what do they do? They run into their bedroom, they go underneath the covers and they just say, I just want to be alone. I don't want to talk to anybody anymore. Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, no, we are here. We're standing here for you. We know what you're dealing with. We're right here. Come and talk to us. Come and speak to us. Turn to me. I know that feeling that you can't describe to anybody. I know that it's happening inside of you. So listen to what Allah Azza wa Jal said. أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ الصَّدُرُكْ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ what they say about you, O Muhammad. You notice that Allah didn't say, Bima yaf'alun. Allah didn't say what the mushrikun are doing to you. So if people stare at you because of the way you look, they laugh at you because of the way you talk, they scrutinize you because of the practices and choices you make, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, those are the things that are going to get inside of you and hurt you and, and mess around with your feelings and your thoughts. Those are the things that are going to bother you more than as opposed to just people just looking at you. It's when somebody comes up to you and saying, Akhi, you're growing a beard? So what, what's up with all that hair? You know, start doing the, you know, the 45 minute beard thing that the kids do today. They do that, um, the thread or the, 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 the pin beard, or I forget what it's called. But basically it's a string and you literally, it's like jihad fi sabilillah when you're in front of the mirror to get this thing done. So that's what they're doing. 
and you're spending all of this time just so that you can achieve a little bit of the Islamic thing, but at the same time, you don't have to listen to what people say to you. Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, these words are the things that are going to bother, bother you the most. But here's how to fix the problem now. So we recognize that something is there. بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We recognize people are saying things to you, people are doing things to you. So how do we solve it? Listen to what Allah Azza wa Jal told you to do. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ Allah Azza wa Jal said, and make tasbih or praise or remembrance or dhikr to Allah Azza wa Jal بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ now just pause for a moment before we look at that second part of the ayah. Allah said, make tasbih. You know, tasbih comes from the word sabaha. Sabaha means to acknowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal, all of His qualities, all of His attributes are befitting to Him and there is no deficiency in Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what tasbih is. That's why when you say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, you're doing all of these adhkar. What you're doing is you're affirming that Allah azza wa jal has no deficiency in him. Why is that so important when you're going through these problems with your feelings? Listen to the psychology of this ayah and what it's trying to teach you and I. Allah azza wa jal is saying to you that when you're in this state and you can't get control over yourself, the first thing you should do is start moving your tongue. Allah didn't say go and pray. Allah didn't say go and make dua. Allah didn't say go and read Quran. The first thing Allah said is whatever state you're in, you hid under the covers and you're all by yourself, the first thing you should start doing is start calling upon Allah and make tasbih. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Astaghfirullah. La ilaha illallah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Allah says start moving your tongue. Pause for a moment. You know when somebody goes through these problems in their life, it's really, really upsetting, it's really, really depressing. You feel sad and you feel horrible. Now when you're going through these problems, do people normally want to use tasbih or adhkar during these times? It's very difficult to do that. It's very difficult to say to a person who spends most of their days crying, to say to them, you know what? Just make tasbih. Remember Allah. Make adhkar. This person can't even swallow their food properly and you're gonna go and say to them to do this? It's very difficult for them to do that. So what is Allah Azza wa Jal really saying here? Allah is saying for you to make tasbih in a positive way. Be optimistic about your situation. Know that I am here and I'm listening to you and I have knowledge of your situation. I know what's going on. So I want you to start to praise me and start thanking me and start making tasbih to me. You're going through a miserable time. What are you thanking Allah for? You're thanking Allah Azza wa Jal for putting you through that. You know why? Because now the process has begun for you to start analyzing and thinking about the choices you make in your life. You see, people always ask the question, why do bad things happen? Why, why is it that bad things happen to people? And some people they say, well, it's because Allah wants to test you so you become a better person. That's actually not the primary reason why tests happen to us. Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Baqarah describes a number of different tests. You guys all know the ayah. Until the end of the ayah. Allah is going to test you by take, striking fear and hunger, taking away money, wealth, and so on from you. Now you're losing all of these things. You're going through a tough and a difficult time in your life. What did Allah Azza wa Jal say to you? وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Congratulations, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, you are amongst the people who have patience. You're congratulating me because I just lost my son? You're congratulating me because I just lost my job? You're telling me all of these good things now? You're telling me to be happy about this? The reason why you're doing that is because the reason why you're going through these problems in the first place is Allah doesn't want your life to be miserable. Allah wants you to learn to be patient in your life. 
the reason why you were in that relationship and you were hoping to get married to her, but two days before the nikah, you guys have been engaged for like a year, two days before the nikah, she calls you and she's like, I think you're ugly and I don't want to get married to you anymore. Okay, <laughs> this ugly thing keeps coming up. So she says, I don't want to get married. I, I don't feel right. And you're thinking to yourself, what did I do? What's wrong? I, mean, I just don't feel right. I don't want to get married anymore. The engagement is done. <coughs> the nikah is done. And you're thinking, oh Allah, why are you doing this to me? Why are you putting me through this pain? That's not the reason why that happened. You were in that one year engagement because Allah wanted it to finish. So you learn how to be patient in your life. You can't have it all. So Allah is saying, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ Because not all the time in your life, things are going to be a status quo. Things are always going to be going as planned. Some point in your life, you're going to plan things, you're going to make choices, you're going to be forced to do things, you're going to be forced to accept things, and you can't do anything about it. What you have to do is you have to always make sure you make tasbih to Allah Azza wa Jal and thank Him because it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for you to think about what choices you have in your life. So brothers, <coughs> sisters, if any of you are dealing with this right now, solving this problem right now is you have to stop and start thinking about you as a person. <coughs> Don't think about your whole marriage. Don't think about your children. Don't think about the house. Don't think about the job. Start thinking about me, Fatima. Me, Muhammad. Me, so and so. What am I doing wrong? Did I pray Fajr on time in the last six months? How many times have I done? When was the last time I read Quran? When was the last time I praised Allah and I made dua to Him for absolutely no reason? I just wanted to praise Him. The ayah continues. Now that you got your tongue moving, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ This is the second solution to getting control over your life again and feel good about yourself. Allah says, and be amongst the people who make sajda and prostrate. Allah didn't say, وَكُمْ مَعَ الْقَائِمِينَ وَكُمْ مَعَ الْرَاكِعِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal didn't say, and be amongst the people who are making ruku or standing in prayer. Allah singled out sujood. Why? When are you closest to Allah Azza wa Jal? In sajda. So what is Allah calling you to? Allah, for Him, it's not enough that you just remember Him. Allah says, don't just remember me, but get close to me. Get near to me. Think about me each and every moment of your life. Remember me through the difficult times, through the good times. Remember me so that when you do call upon me for something, I'm going to respond to you. Imagine you have a friend that you meet and you only know him or her for about two or three days. And they come up to you and they say, Brother, they say, Brother, can you lend me 12,000 TT dollars? And you're thinking to yourself, I just know you for like three days. What are you talking about? I'm not going to lend you 12,000 TT dollars. But your best friend who you've known for five or six years, they come up to you and they say, I want to borrow 10,000 TT dollars. Who are you more likely to give money to? The person you're well acquainted with. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, look, when you, get, when you come to me, stay with me and stay close to me, just like how you do when you're in sujood. Because when you do call upon me, at any spontaneous moment of your life, when you do call upon me, I'm going to be here and I'm going to be willing to give you. I'm going to be here and be willing to respond to you. I don't want you to call me when you're going through rough times. I want you to call upon me even the good times in your life. I want you to have a relationship with me. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, and be amongst the people who are in sajda. So what just happened? You worked on your tongue. You started moving your lips. Your tongue is moistened now with Allah's remembrance. Now it's time for action. So go and start praying. I can't tell you enough how much prayer, how important it is for every single human being, especially you and I. <coughs> prayer is like the seed to every ounce of goodness in your life. 
It's the seed that you plant. If you ever want to achieve goodness in every single factor, in every single part of your life, it's going to start off with salah. Almost every single time when Allah Azza wa Jal discusses a problem in Quran, if he's dealing with the munafiqun, if he's dealing with jihad, if he's dealing with mushrikun, he's dealing with problems, your feelings, almost every single time salah is mentioned after. Allah will tell you to go and pray. Allah will mention the raki'een. Allah will mention salah. Something associated with prayer is mentioned. So be amongst the people who have sajda. Listen to the last message Allah leaves you with. وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ وَعْبُدُ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal says, and worship your master. Allah didn't say, وَعْبُدْنِي Allah didn't say worship me. Allah said worship your master. Why? The language of here, the structure of this ayah is real powerful. Because Allah is saying to you that regardless of how you feel and how things are going in your life, I'm your Rabb. And you better not forget that. I'm your master and I'm in charge. So don't think it's the community that's destroying you. Don't think it's your husband or your wife that's destroying you. Don't think that's the people around you that's destroying you. I'm the one that still has control at the end of the day. O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't think it's the mushrikun that are doing this to you. Don't think it's the Quraysh, don't think it's your enemies that are doing this to you. At the end of the day, I still have control. Tomorrow I'm going to give you a glimpse insha'Allah of what's happening to those brothers and sisters in Philistine, Syria and Burma, all over the Muslim world. <coughs> and perhaps give you a perspective of really how to view and understand how all of this is happening. Jazakumullah. How all of this is happening. Why is this happening to brothers and sisters in Palestine? Why is it happening to the believers, the chosen people of this world? Why are they going through all of this? There's a hidden secret. And that secret Allah Azza wa Jal gave it to you in Quran, which is I'll, sh I'll share with you tomorrow insha'Allah. وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ وَاعْبُدُ رَبَّكَ Imagine you tell a brother who's crying, a sister who's crying, you say, go and be in sajda and go and pray. They start praying. Three or four months later, the same problem happens again. And before you know it, they feel miserable all over again. How confident are they going to feel about salah? How confident are they going to feel that that solution is working? So you know what Allah Azza wa Jal said? Allah didn't say stop now okay, and find something else. Allah says, at least worship me. At least do something in your life. At least read some Quran. At least listen to some Quran. At least be around good people. Have good friends. Make good choices. Do something in your life that's positive. When does all of this stop? <coughs> Until the ultimate truth comes to you. One of the terms used to describe death in Quran Allah calls it yaqeen, certainty. It's going to come to you and you can't do anything about it. Why didn't Allah say, Hatta يَأْتِيَكَ الْمَوْتِ Why didn't Allah say, until death comes to you? Why didn't Allah mention death by its title? Why did He use yaqeen here? Think about the person who's going through depression. Think about the person who's going through anxiety. The last thing you want to say to a person in that state is start talking to them about death. Because you know what's happening today? People who have depression and they don't get control over it, as a matter of fact, it begins to escalate and they lose control over, the, over it. They, it eventually leads them to their death. So Allah doesn't want to put that in your head. Allah doesn't want you to even think about that. Just know that when you change your life, don't do it because you have a sickness and now you've gotten the treatment and it's all good and you go back to status quo. Allah says, make it a life-changing promise that when you make better choices and you start praying and you start building a proper relationship with your Creator, don't stop until you leave this world. You're gonna change for life now. You're gonna do this and you're not gonna choose the Qur'an as just your treatment. You know people, they come up to me all the time. And he asked me, Brother Muslah, I have an exam tomorrow. What's the ayah in the Qur'an that's gonna make me pass? Oh, Brother Muslah, <coughs> I have a fever. What's the ayah that's gonna cure it better than this medicine the doctor gave me? And that's what they, that's how Qur'an was for them. 
And so Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that when you make this promise, you have to struggle for the rest of your life to do this. Don't use Qur'an as just a treatment. Even Allah Azza wa Jal told you, فَلَمَّا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُ الضُّرُّ مَرَّ كَأَلَّمْ يَدْعُنَا إِلَى ضُرِّ مَسَّ When we healed their problem, when we cured them of that depression, that sickness, those issues in their life, when we started building their life and they started gaining happiness again, guess what they did? They went back to square one. They became ungrateful. When you were in the hospital, you were remembering Allah day and night. The day you were released and your health was 100% again, what happened to you? Allah said, you just went back to your good old life once again. That is the most scariest thought you can think of, of how to use Qur'an. I'm going to be talking about this insha'Allah further tomorrow, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. But brothers and sisters, I hope that at least these last two verses in Surah Al-Hijr gives you a glimpse for you to get control over your life, to start feeling good about yourself, to start feeling good about the choices you make. If you're rich or if you're poor, if you're sad or if you're happy, if you're with companion or you have company or you're alone, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you can say, I am proud to be Muslim. I am proud that Allah chose me. And I'm proud that I wake up every single day and have another chance to continue bettering myself and becoming a better believer in this world. Why? Because the yaqeen is slowly creeping by. You're just on this conveyor belt. Kadih, you're on a conveyor belt. And you're just moving forward. You can't press the button to turn it off or slow it down. If you turn backwards or if you face that way, you turn this way, guess what? The conveyor belt still keeps going forward and eventually you're gonna die. So you continue to worship me, continue to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, until that moment comes to you. Death is not something that if you're sitting and you're like watching a movie or you're chilling out eating doubles, and death will be like, oh, wait, wait, you're eating doubles? Okay, I'll come back on Jumar was you're in sujood. When it's there, it's there. And you can't stop it and you can't do anything about it. So brothers and sisters, if you're not doing it already, at least for this weekend, revive your heart. This conference is called Revival of the Ummah. Put some energy and juice back into your heart again. And start feeling good about yourself. And start recognizing that you are a chosen person in this world. Allah didn't create you in vain for no reason. You have a purpose to be here. And you have, a, you have the right to feel good about yourself. And to feel happy about yourself inshaAllah. And with that, I conclude brothers and sisters. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wipe away those tears of sadness and replace them with tears of joy. And I ask Allah azza wa jal for anybody who is sitting here who's struggling with the religion to make it the strongest thing in your life. Allahumma ameen. And from my heart to all of you brothers and sisters, Trinidad, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all for all the goodness that you have inside of you and in your hearts and in your family. Wallahi, I never thought I would say this, but I absolutely love this country. I absolutely love the people here. I absolutely love the atmosphere here. I just took a tour in the bazaar area and the reception and the kindness and the smile and the people, subhanAllah, there's something very special about you people. Don't lose sight of it. And make sure that insha'Allah ta'ala, once you have that goodness inside of you, continue to feed that thirst and continue to feed it with the remembrance and tasbih of Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless you all. I thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.